This is the Guns Magazine podcast, episode number 25. Hi there, and welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting people who make up the world of shooting, hunting, and the firearms industry. Today, I'm talking with well-known Second Amendment journalist and activist, Dave Workman. Before we get started, I'd like to welcome a new sponsor, Right on Optics. Right on Optics is the only law enforcement and military veteran-owned optics company in the world. It was founded on the premise a customer's hard-earned dollar should buy quality optics with the industry's best service at every price point. Right on is passionate about offering high-quality optics at the industry's most competitive prices and always putting the customer first. Every right on optic goes through a rigorous dual inspection process in Tucson, Arizona, and is backed by right on's industry leading warranty, including rapid new product replacement on all returns. For more information on right on optics and to see the difference, visit rightonoptics.com. That's right on, R I T O N, optics.com. Today's guest, Dave Workman, is a prolific writer on gun topics and a longtime thorn in the side of anti-gunners. With no nonsense but an intelligent approach to the pro-gun debate, his byline has appeared in countless publications, and he's often a guest on mainstream media shows, serving as a foil to the so-called gun safety organizations. During our talk today, Dave offers some suggestions on how to really shut down such debates with plain facts and the importance of every single gun owner voting in the November elections. We even talked briefly about the mess over at NRA headquarters. Now here's my talk with Dave Workman. Well, good morning, Dave. Good morning, Brent. Well, I talked to Dave quite a bit. He is our 2A defense columnist in Guns Magazine, and we love having him on board. People always shy away from the term expert, but you're an expert on the whole Second Amendment thing. Well, yeah, I guess there's a good and a bad to that uh, as a career journalist. Uh, I get uh, calls frequently or emails from other reporters asking me about this gun or that gun or how to, how do uh, the gun people uh, think about this or that subject. Uh, you know, I've been the senior editor for uh, the gunmag.com, which used to be Gun Week uh, for 20 years now. And prior to that, I uh, was the senior editor and the, the shooting and, and guns guy uh, really over at uh, the old fishing and hunting news, which is uh, now, sadly, it's, it's gone uh, the way of the dodo. But I do a monthly column on shooting and hunting for uh, uh, Northwest Sportsman Magazine. I write for Ammo Land. And of course, uh, the, the biggest kick that I've gotten uh, in a long time is, is writing for Guns Magazine. I, I read that as a kid. I uh, grew up uh, <laughs> with Guns Magazine and its sister organization, American Handgunner. And I, I've got a column over at American Handgunner Online called Insider Online. So uh, I rarely sleep if you've gotten that so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we certainly enjoy having you. And I got to say one thing. Uh, it's not fair when you're on a podcast and you have a far better voice than the the host. Well, uh, that's your tough luck, Brent. You know, it sucks to be you sometimes, but... <laughs> <laughs> It's often been said I've got a face for radio, and I certainly do. Well, me too, and uh, that, that's why if I ever went back into radio, I had a radio show uh, for a short time about 20 years ago, uh, or, well, almost 30 years ago now, and uh, uh, I, I think that I should polish up my FM side and, and start uh, getting into those mellow, well, we're going to talk about this gun today. and <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe we could start doing radio, you know, W-G-U-N, yeah, all guns. You all oh, the like time. <laughs> well, let's get into the meat of today's discussion, which it's pretty serious business because obviously the world is kind of a crazy place right now. And there's a lot of uh, social restrictions and governmental restrictions on individual freedom. And on one hand, you know, there, there's reasons behind that. It's for the greater good. But on the other hand, uh, as government officials are wont to do, sometimes they're going too far and you're you're in the middle of that fight. Well, yeah. And uh, I think that uh, what has happened in some of the states is that governors, uh, anti-gun governors, as it turns out, have used the COVID ID, COVID-19 pandemic as an excuse to shut down gun stores 
and stop gun shops and uh, even close shooting ranges. Uh, and it, it is uh, obvious uh, that this is not something that really require it needs to be done. I, I've talked to uh, gun shop operators uh, in Washington, Florida, and all well around the country, and they have developed ways to uh, accomplish social distancing, if you want to call it that, and, and remain open, do business, and allow people to exercise their Second Amendment rights. And, you know, that that's the American way, I guess. You improvise and you overcome. Uh, and in some cases, the Second Amendment Foundation, which owns uh, the gun mag, they had to file federal lawsuits against some governors. Uh, there was a, a lawsuit in California against a sheriff. Uh, there's also one going on against the governor down there. Uh, SAF has taken legal actions in, let's see, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, um, New Mexico, California. We haven't started here in Washington yet, but uh, I, I think eventually uh, SAF is going to get around to Washington State too. And really what's at stake here is the, the exercise of a constitutionally protected fundamental right. You know, last, uh, oh, I think it was uh, about four weeks ago, three, four weeks ago, the Trump administration's uh, Department of Homeland Security offered some guidelines, and in those guidelines, gun shops and their employees were recognized as uh, necessary uh, essential businesses. Now, these governors say that's non-essential. Uh, so, you know, we wind up in court and we're going to let the judges decide. Yep. You know, never let a good crisis go to waste. I believe that was a uh, progressive politician, wasn't it? Yeah, that was Rahm Emanuel in Chicago who said that. <laughs> and uh, you know, he's he's no longer the mayor of Chicago, but he's still out there causing trouble. So, you know, this is the environment that we live in. And my, my humble opinion is that if a governor can say that a marijuana shop is an essential business, then a gun shop's got to be an essential business. <laughs> Exactly. Now, when talking to folks, do you see what these politicians doing is starting to create a wave of backlash? Well, I think uh, we've seen uh, the, the reaction to this in, in some of the demonstrations that have taken place. You know, earlier this year, uh, you had 22,000 people descend on capital of Virginia in Richmond to tell the uh, Democrat majority down there, hey, no more gun control. And of course, they turned right around and did it anyway, which uh, when when the uh, when the state legislature, when they run again for office in 2021, it's not going to be this November, it's going to be next year. I think those 22,000 gun owners are going to have already been very busy out there in the grassroots, and they may shift that whole legislature and the governor's mansion back to uh, the GOP. Uh, look at the demonstrations that they had uh, you know, in Washington State here uh, just recently. They had something like uh, 3,500 to 4,000 people show up down there, not necessarily just to uh, protect their Second Amendment rights. There was a lot of that uh, involved in the, in the demonstration. But the rally also brought together small business people, Lots of taxpayers who uh, can't pay their taxes because they, they don't have jobs right now. Uh, you know, there is a movement, I think, coming up from the grassroots. The public is finally learning that we're in charge, not not the people we elect. We elect those people to represent us and to, to make sure that the government operates. We don't elect those people to rule over us. And uh, at least the, the grassroots organizers that I've talked to, you know, they're, they're saying, hey, you know, it's time to, to wake up the country. We're in charge and we need to remind the politicians that we're in charge. So they, you know, that's where we're going with this, I think. What a novel concept. They work for us. Yeah. <laughs> we, I guess every generation has to rediscover perhaps. But, you know, something I've noticed here in the last couple of days is, again, the mass media is, is wringing their hands and dampening their undergarments. They're trying to tie the whole uh, protest, reopening protests, uh, you know, which are, in their view, a horrible, horrible thing, um, tie those to the Second Amendment. So they're tying two, you know, utterly evil concepts together in their mind. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Well, as you know, I'm a, 
uh, career journalist. I, I have a degree in journalism, and uh, I am stunned and saddened at the direction a lot of my colleagues in the press have gone uh, on the Second Amendment. The First Amendment, I make my living with it. You know, we're talking First Amendment as we speak right now. This is the First Amendment in action. Well, the Second Amendment is just as important. And I think by trying to link uh, the protests uh, with just Second Amendment activists, th they're trying to paint those people into a corner as a bunch of right-wing nutballs, <laughs> uh, people who are on the fringes, <clears throat> they're trying to marginalize what the what the grassroots people are doing and and this is far beyond what uh, the second amendment is all about on the other hand we have to remember that the second amendment is the fallback against tyranny and i've seen a lot of people using the word tyranny on social media lately and and i'm not sure that i can uh, disagree with a lot of it because when when you've got a governor announcing various emergency orders that shut down small businesses, which is the backbone of our economy. And then they're saying, well, you know, we got to go two more weeks or we're not going to be able to uh, reopen business for another month. Or you know, they, they keep extending this out. And it's almost like they're trying to use this as a strategy to affect the uh, November elections. If they can keep the people out of work long enough and keep the economy on the ropes long enough, maybe they think they're gonna change things on Capitol Hill and the White House. And remember what I've been writing in Guns Magazine since I took that position, We've got a president in there who, you know, you may or may not like the guy, but he has filled, uh, I think, 200 spots in the federal court system, uh, including two on the U.S. Supreme Court with good conservative judges and now two justices. Uh, we're starting to level the playing field in the courts, and that's where the Second Amendment, the future of the Second Amendment, is really going to be decided, and, and that's in the federal courts. The, the anti-gunners and the liberals, they don't like that at all, and they want to change that, and they want to change it bad. You know, I'm not a big time conspiracy theorist because I found having worked in government most of my life and also been a journalist that when you come up with conspiracy theories, what it does, it wraps everything up in a nice, nice, neat bow. And things are usually a little more complicated than that. There may be some people with nefarious uh, goals behind certain things, but generally it's more of a factor of, of the basic <laughs> human drives, you know, greed, uh, lust for power, et cetera, et cetera. But having said all that, I think you've hit a, a pretty interesting point that maybe uh, some of our federal lawmakers who hate the current president so much, they are willing to maybe drive our economy into a dumpster because they feel that the common man, if he stays out of work long enough and he's hurting long enough, he'll blame the president. But I have to say in the social distancing talk I've done with my neighbors and friends and my, my colleagues across the country right now, and I would say for the foreseeable future, nobody's blaming the president. So do you think this backfire or this uh, strategy might backfire on the uh, Democratic Party? Uh, you know, there is that possibility. And uh, to be honest with you, I think that uh, when you look at some of the politicians, as I do every day, because I write about these guys and, and ladies, uh, some of them aren't bright enough to come up with a conspiracy. They're just, uh, <laughs> you know, when when the, the Speaker of the House the sits there in her kitchen and delights at the idea that, gee, I've got a refrigerator full of stylish ice cream that's like $11 a pint or something. <laughs> uh, you know, that does not ring well with people who have been out of work for a month, month and a half now, and they're wondering how to make ends meet. So, yeah, it yeah. could backfire on them big time, especially if we do get the economy back rolling. And remember, uh, a large part of the economy – as I mentioned earlier, is small business. And small businesses are mom and pop gun shops, uh, maybe a guy with two gun stores or, or somebody who's making a living at uh, or operating a gun shop in a sporting goods store uh, anywhere in the United States. Those people are hurting too. And, uh, you know, we talked earlier about how uh, these folks have uh, come up with novel ideas 
about how to operate their businesses and allow their customers to continue uh, buying guns and ammunition. They've improvised, they've overcome. These are the smart people, the smart uh, business people who, uh, they, you know, they're fighting for their economic survival. And yeah, they're looking at November. And, and, and to, frankly, I think that uh, when you look at some of the people who are running the opposition on Capitol Hill and in in the governor's mansions around the country that have cracked down and, and tried to shut down gun shops, this is not going to end well for them. And these guys are mainly up for election this fall. And, you know, I'm, I keep trying to tell my readers, now's the time to get registered to vote. If you're not registered, make darn sure what uh, precinct you vote in. Make sure who your congressperson is. Make sure who who your state lawmaker is. And cast your votes accordingly. If somebody's been hosing you, get rid of them. So, Dave, I'm going to touch on something that uh, will probably have you standing on the chair and pontificating by the time you're done. But truly, when we when it comes to all these onerous regulations and uh, politicians that don't have our interests at heart as uh, Second Amendment supporters, uh, the problem is us. Uh, you know, I hate to look in the mirror and point, but um, it it is us, and it's because we we sit around and we don't exercise our political muscle. That's something you've you've warned about a lot. Well, yeah, I'm going to continue warning about it for the next seven months until we have an election. I think that way too many people in the gun community, uh, I call them the firearms fraternity, for lack of a better term, uh, they seem to believe that just sitting at their keyboard, pounding away about the Second Amendment and throw the people out, that's going to solve the problem. Well, it doesn't. All you're doing is shoot your mouth off on the Internet. Mm -hmm. What you really need to do is vote, and you need to get your friends to vote and your family to vote, and especially all of your shooting and hunting buddies. you got to make darn sure that they are registered to vote, that they know who to vote for, and uh, more importantly, who to vote against. Uh, and this goes all the way down to the local city councils, even the school boards. It's important uh, because you want to make sure that your kids or your grandkids or your neighbor's kids are getting a good education and they're not using textbooks uh, that are filled with stuff about, well, yeah, the, the Second Amendment means you can have a state militia. And I think we all know that that's not true. But. Uh, it's so important for the the average gun owner to become an activist gun owner, especially in 2020. Uh, if if you're not in the game, you're going to be left on the sidelines, and you're going to wonder, hey, what happened? How come we didn't fix this? Well, we didn't fix it because you didn't vote. I guess the 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 most horrifying thing to me is when I'm at a gun show and somebody walks up to me and we start talking and I I ask them, well, who'd you vote for? And the response I get is, well, I don't vote. I don't want my name on the list. Or I can't remember who I voted for. Or I voted for so-and-so because my grandpa voted that way. And I I look at people like that as being just mind-numbingly stupid. And there's a lot of that floating around. Uh, you've you've got to understand what this is all about. You know, voting isn't just a right; it's a responsibility. Same as owning a gun, and you got to take care of both of those rights, or you're going to lose both of them. Exactly. And and I will add one in there that I hear quite a bit is, well, I don't believe in either one of the candidates, so I didn't vote. You know, in real life, we're allowed to disagree with folks, Mm -hmm. but on the whole, especially if you're talking the Second Amendment, you know, I may not agree with candidate A on his position on abortion or capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. But if he's a pro 2A person versus somebody else who's not a pro 2A person, I'm willing to bet we agree on most things. So I think it's more important that he gets my vote than me staying home and going, well, I didn't like either one of them. Well, yeah. And I tell you, Brent, uh, this is an interesting situation that we get into. And I wind up talking to people like this frequently. If you don't believe that a candidate is 
100% on your side, then you don't vote for them. And that's nonsense. If you've got somebody out there that you agree with, say, 80% of the time, you can educate that person. You can volunteer to help get that person elected. You can become the go-to guy or the go-to gal uh, for that candidate to call up when they've got a question about firearms. You can become a, a serious uh, and important influence on that person. On the other side of the uh, of the aisle, of course, if if you allow somebody to get elected who absolutely hates everything you believe in, you're not going to make any inroads with that person at all. They're going to stab you in the back, in the front, and uh, probably at the top of the head anytime they can because they just don't like uh, your lifestyle at all. They, you know, they want to get rid of the Second Amendment. And frankly, uh, we're in a position this year to make damn sure that a lot of those people don't get elected. All we got to do is just get up the, off the couch, make sure we're registered to vote, and fill out a ballot. And, you know, what is that? It takes 20 minutes out of your life. So it, it's going to affect the rest of your life and the lives of your children and grandchildren. That's pretty important. I would say so. You know, you hit on a point that, that has always kind of been a uh, hot topic with me, and you've touched on it recently in one of your columns in Guns Magazine, and that's how to act when you're trying to advocate for the Second Amendment, because I've seen some people that I, I really respect what they're trying to do, but they're going about it completely the wrong way, uh, shouting at people and uh, or trying to frighten them or belittle them. That's not how you win friends and influence people, whether you're talking about your neighbors, your family, a uh, school board candidate or a, a congressman. Well, yeah. And uh, I think uh, you're aware of one of the misadventures I had early in my career. Uh, uh, it was an, a day where a bunch of us went and talked to a local congressman and one of our guys showed up wearing coveralls and muddy boots, rubber boots, because he'd been out, I think, steelhead fishing or something. <laughs> and and uh, we all kind of sat away from him because he didn't smell too good either. But <laughs> he, he he sat there and he, he uh, you know, we were talking about a discussion uh, regarding, I, at the time, it was semi-automatic rifles. And here again, uh, that's something that uh, the anti-gunners, they didn't just discover this. They've been trying to ban AR-15s for a generation and maybe longer because they just don't like them. But uh, in the middle of the conversation, this guy just pipes up out of nowhere. He says, you know, I could kill you just as easy with a bolt-action rifle as I could with a semi-automatic. And, you know, the rest of us are sitting there wishing that he'd have a coronary or something. <laughs> Shut up! Uh, uh, wow. Uh, but fortunately, uh, the the person we were talking to, the Congress guy, he was with us and he, he kind of understood where the guy was coming from. And, uh, you know, there was no permanent harm done. But in a public meeting, if you're going to defend the Second Amendment, show up wearing casual uh, uh, attire, you know, maybe maybe a sport jacket or something. If you don't have a sport jacket, at least wear a clean shirt and be able to speak fluently and precisely and briefly about what you want to make as a point and then sit down and be quiet and let somebody else speak. Because, you know, we, we live in a republic a democratic republic, I guess, and everybody's got the right to an opinion, even if you disagree with them. Don't try to talk over people, be polite, be professional. And uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, your side, you know, the, the, the Second Amendment side, the rights side will prevail. I, I tell a story that uh, I got a good friend who still works in media, and we occasionally have, uh, we meet high atop Mahogany Ridge at the local Mexican restaurant, and we have uh, have a few adult beverages. And it's one of those things, I really enjoy hanging with him because we politically probably are 99% apart, but it's one of those things that he says his piece. I say my piece. We really don't change each other's minds so much, but at least, you know, I don't look at him as some kind of subhuman because of his beliefs and, and he feels the same way. But recently, uh, before the quarantine, we had met and we were, you know, pontificating on everything and we got around to gun control. And, you know, my position is gun control is maintaining, you know, steady front sight focus and, and trigger control. <laughs> yeah, he, He's completely the opposite. 
And something he said really struck me because it was so heartfelt. We were talking about, you know, all the different uh, gun control issues. And I shot him down most of the time with fact. And then finally he looked at me and goes, but we have to do something. And I said, well, what do you mean? We have to do something. And it was that that heartfelt plea that he made. We have to do something. I realized he feels this rather than thinks it. And his heart is bleeding for victims of violence and things like that. So when I'm approaching an anti, uh, you know, anti-gun person from this point, I have to approach it from the fact they're they're operating from a place of we have to do something. So if we can maybe give them a, a few more ideas on how we can effectively solve the their perceived problem of gun violence, um, they're more inclined to listen. Yeah. Uh, screaming doesn't get anybody anywhere and it's bad for your ears. <laughs> um, but I agree with that uh, approach. I think one of the things that I've been able to accomplish here in the Puget Sound region of Washington state where I grew up, I'm a journalist. Everybody who deals with me knows that whatever else I do around here at the uh, Second Amendment Foundation building, I'm a career journalist. And I talk to them on that level. The reporters, uh, most of them respect that. And I, I explain to them, hey, the, the facts are all on our side of this thing. Just look up the FBI uniform crime report. Don't take my word for it. Just do your own research. I'll, I'll show you what to look for. Uh, when I write about uh, this issue, as I do every day at uh, various publications that, that I, I run or I work for, uh, I try to use fact because the other side is emotion driven. And when when I hear people say, well, we've got to do something, and, and I do, I hear that all the time, just the same as you do. We've got to do something. Uh, I'll say, well, yeah, you know, I got a good idea what we can do. We can lock up the bad guys and leave the good guys alone. How, how does that sound? Uh, it's what? amazing. <laughs> you know, I just, oh, well, I didn't really think of that, you know. <laughs> just, yeah. uh, and, and now we've got governors that are turning loose uh, people out of jails to protect them from the coronavirus. And then the other day on television, the mayor of uh, New York City was just appalled that uh, some of the inmates that had been released from Rikers Island went out and committed new crimes. And I'm sitting yeah. here thinking, oh, wait a minute, come on. Well, that's what I don't understand. In some cases, they're threatening arrest of people violating social quarantine, but yet they're releasing people from jail. So <laughs> yeah. how does how does that all work? Well, it doesn't. That's the thing. It just doesn't <laughs> work at all. And but it so, makes a nice sound bite. Yeah, it, 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 it makes it. Yeah, you're right. That's what it is. It's sound bite politics. And soundbite politics has never accomplished anything that I know of. Uh, I, I think when you look back at some of the, the data that's been available over the years, uh, when in the wake of, say, three strikes and you're out, which actually originated in the building I'm sitting in, uh, and hard time for armed crime, which originated in the building I'm sitting in, the gun people came up with those ideas. Yeah. And they became popular across the country. Even Bill Clinton thought it was a good idea uh, to to lock up hardened criminals and repeat offenders. You get these people off the streets and they're not out there committing crimes. They're where they can't commit crimes. And suddenly you look at the data and, and the crime levels seem to drop, whether it's property crime or violent crime, the crime level goes down. And another thing that I think there is some correlation to, although uh, the, the anti-gun crowd is loath to talk about it, we have doubled the number of concealed carry permit and license holders in this country in the last uh, 15 or 20 years. And the, the crime has gone down. Uh, I think there's a correlation there because no recidivist felon that I ever ran into, and I've run into a few of them, uh, they don't want to think that their next intended victim might turn around and shoot them. Exactly. Uh, you know, that's, that's a good deterrent factor. 
So, you know, there are things that we can do and uh, they sound pretty level headed. And when the, when they talk to us about what well, we got to have common sense gun laws, and I say, yeah, you know, we do have to have common sense gun laws. First and foremost, let's teach gun safety in public schools so that we can reduce accidents among children. Let's uh, uh, make sure that if you if you need a firearm in an emergency, you can get one. Uh, let's make sure that uh, if you want to carry a firearm, we make that process as uh, reduce red tape as possible. Uh, and always, and I, I mean this as a certified firearms instructor, I always counsel people, get competent instruction. Seek the best instruction you can, and you're never going to be disappointed. Agreed. And you touch on a really important point there that we're going to get into in just a moment that kind of makes me crazy is the whole quote unquote gun safety organization that's never taught gun safety ever. But before we get there, we've we've talked about politics and we've talked about the importance of getting out and voting in the next uh, presidential election. Let's talk worst case scenario. What happens if Joe Biden and whatever liberal that he appoints as his uh, chooses as his running mate? What if they they gain office? What do you see happening? Um, I see that the courts, because we've been able to uh, put a lot of conservative judges in positions on the courts, they're going to be pretty busy for the next four years. Uh, <laughs> because every time that these uh, new people turn around, we're going to be hitting them with a lawsuit to tell them, no, you can't do that. Uh, I think we've seen uh, with this coronavirus thing, how carried away some of these individuals can get. Uh, they ignore the the uh, public sentiment. They ignore the Constitution. That's not a good place to be, especially in a country uh, that is unlike any other country on the planet. We've got a Constitution that has some teeth in it. And I think that in the past several years, especially since the uh, 2010 Supreme Court ruling in McDonald v. City of Chicago, uh, where we incorporated the Second Amendment to the states, we've seen the the gun rights crowd, uh, the Second Amendment Foundation, the National Rifle Association, Firearms uh, uh, Coalition in California. We've seen them get really active because now they can use the law to stop some of these dumb laws and, and tell these anti-gun politicians no. Um, and and I, I was talking to a, a friend of mine here, I don't know, a couple of months ago. I actually am concerned that if, if Biden does win the election, he's going to be a train wreck in the White House. Uh, it, it is clear to me that he kind of babbles a little bit. He doesn't know what he's talking about <laughs> when he's talking about firearms. And uh, kind of exactly like me, yeah, but I'm well, not running for president. <laughs> yeah, I think hopefully that uh, if if Biden is the Democratic Party's nominee and he gets a running mate that, uh, you know, I know he's looking for a, a female, a, a woman or a, a minority. And you know that he's going to pick a running mate that agrees with with his position on firearms and, and all the other social issues. Cooler heads have to prevail, and that's that's why I encourage people: you got to register to vote, and you got to get involved in this election. Uh, you may not like Donald Trump, you may not like somebody that's running for Congress in your state, but it's a heck of a lot better than having some knucklehead in office who doesn't like what you do or like how you live. Now, let's talk about the whole gun safety organization. You recently had a uh, column in Guns Magazine that I thought was fantastic, and I've I've stolen this idea and tried to, to spread it around. When people are debating with folks about gun safety organizations, ask them when was the last time they taught a gun safety class, and it shuts down the conversation right now. Oh, yeah. I have had conversations with anti-gunners who will tell you, well, hey, I'm a gun owner now. Oh, you really? What kind of guns do you have? What, where do you keep them? And that's, that's really when the conversation stops because 
they don't know what guns they have. Or, well, you know, I, I went I went hunting with my dad as as a little boy, so I shot guns. It, that doesn't cut it. But uh, the, I know the column you're talking about, and I took a, a lifetime of experience dealing with these people, and I put it in, into words. You, you've got to be able to challenge these people and leave politeness at the front door when you're challenging somebody that wants to strangle your rights. Uh, they don't have a right to do that. Ask them. Be, be gutsy enough to say, yeah, well, where did you take a course or did you ever teach a course? Where do they offer courses? Your gun safety organization, tell me, tell me about the classes that you teach or that uh, how many instructors uh, on firearm safety do you guys have? And it just, they, they come down with a case of lockjaw because <laughs> they, they don't have any of that stuff. And I'm constantly challenging uh, my colleagues in the media to, to not call these people gun safety groups because that's not what they, they're gun control groups. Yep. And that's really what's going on here. Their idea of gun safety is taking guns away from everybody. Yep. And, you know, I, I got to hand it to them. That was a really brilliant strategy. You basically call something what it's not, and you co-opt language that nobody would argue against. Nobody would argue against gun safety. Nobody would argue against, quote unquote, common sense laws, but that's not what they're describing at all. Unfortunately, they're not a gun safety organization. They're not asking for common sense gun laws. Basically, they want to do away with firearms. That may not be their stated goal, but ultimately that's what uh, anti-gunners want because they're scared of them and we have to do something and whatever uh, little white lie they have to tell and whatever grammar they need to use, they'll use it. So we have to be ready to hit them and, and ask the hard questions. Yeah. And, and, you know, if they tell you that they've got granddad's shotgun, that they keep it in the closet, uh, you know, they're woefully underarmed in my opinion, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, you can trip these guys up. You can trap them with that kind of a comment. And not only do you embarrass them, everybody standing around will be embarrassed for them too, because they really don't know what they're talking about. Ask them what the four rules of gun safety are. And they'll say, huh? Well, well uh, <laughs> gee, I don't know. And, and then say, well, you know who came up with the four rules of gun safety? And when you tell them uh, Jeff Cooper, they don't even know who that is. No, uh, not at all. You know, Jeff Cooper, I knew Jeff Cooper. He was a friend of mine. It's, it's easy to stop these guys in their tracks. All you got to do is use some smarts and be a little bit savvy about it. Learn some diplomacy. And uh, you, you can get them. You, you can get them every time. Great points. Now, on, on a related topic, you know, various organizations are fighting for our rights. The, uh, the number one in terms of membership and dollars is obviously the National Rifle Association. You and I have had lots of conversations about this. What's the end game for the NRA at this point? Well, I tell you, uh, let's start at the personal level. I've known Wayne Lapierre for 30 plus years. I still consider him a dear friend of mine. I know that his name gets dragged through the mud a lot. Um, I know a lot of people who are still on the board who were on the board when I was, and that's been almost 20 years ago. Uh, I, I have a great deal of respect for, for the people at the NRA. I, when I was on the board, I always had a lot of respect and, and treated them with respect. They, they're hurting right now. Uh, I think all of them are dedicated uh, to making sure that the Second Amendment rights of all of our citizens are preserved and protected. Uh, at the same time, uh, I know that they've got some troubles. Uh, hopefully that they'll work that stuff out. Uh, the country needs the National Rifle Association for no other purpose than because of the other stuff that it does, the, the you know, protection of hunting rights, uh, uh, instruction. They've got, they've got a, a network of volunteer firearms instructors out there that would boggle your mind. There's thousands and thousands of us out there always willing to teach somebody proper firearm safety. You're not going to get that anywhere else. 
we work with state legislatures, uh, you know, the Institute for Legislative Action. Uh, those guys are among the best lobbyists there are, and, and they work very closely with state lawmakers to get things done and prevent things from being done to us. Uh, but then you move outside of the realm of the NRA. You got the Second Amendment Foundation that has become a powerhouse in the legal arena. Uh, I, I was talking to Alan Gottlieb, uh, who founded the organization more than 40 years ago, and he came up with this statistic. He said, you know, about 80 percent of all of the gun case law now that is on the books uh, is because of Second Amendment Foundation lawsuits. And I have no reason to doubt him because I've written about this stuff for the last 20 years. Uh, you got the Firearms Policy Coalition. Uh, they're, they're a rising star. Uh, they're based down in California. Uh, of course, the, you know, the, the, the Gun Owners of America, they're a busy bunch. They, they uh, reach out and appeal to uh, an element of the grassroots that uh, other uh, organizations don't get. And I think what we need to keep in perspective we're all on the same side here. We all want the same things. And I think we're at a point in history in 2020 where we need to put down our disagreements, our differences, and unite. Because if we don't, we're going to have a train wreck in November and nobody's going to like what happens after that. Do you think, though, that if Wayne... Uh, would suddenly decide to step down because he's come become such a lightning rod. And I don't care about from the mass media because he's always going to be a lightning rod. Whoever's in that post will be, but he he's become so polarizing to gun owners. But if say today he says, I, that's it. I'm, I'm fading off into the sunset. Do you think that's going to solve the problem and get the NRA back on, on focus? Or do you think in that vacuum, it might even hurt it even further? Well, I can't say for sure one way or the other. You know, if I was Wayne, if it was my decision, uh, I'd probably say, yeah, you know, at, at say the end of June or, or maybe maybe at the end of the year, get us through the election. And, you know, it's time to go home and, and uh, just get out of this because I wouldn't I wouldn't want his job for all the whiskey in Tennessee. I got to tell you, <laughs> uh, it, it, it is a, a mind numbing job. And I have seen him uh, accomplish stuff that I don't know anybody else who could do what he's done. Uh, but, you know, he and I, are, I, I think we're about the same age. We're, I'm 70 years old. And uh, in fact, uh, I can remember uh, vaguely, he and I were talking about being about the same age back when I was on the NRA board, we, you know, just pass an idle talk one time. And, uh, you know, it's time to to enjoy the rest of your life. Yeah, we've got the Second Amendment that is, uh, it's, it's crucial to the American way of life. It's part of the American fabric. Uh, you know, Wayne really, ha he's, he's earned retirement. I don't know if, if that would, uh, quote unquote, straighten out the NRA. I think a lot of the, the animus that's being aimed at the NRA is, is they're trying to knock Wayne out because he's been so damn good at what he does. But you get the finances straightened out, uh, do whatever it needs to, to get done. Uh, and, and then, you know, it may, maybe it's time to, to go sit on the porch. I, I'm looking forward to retirement if they ever leave me alone long enough to do it. <laughs> as long as your column comes in every month. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, you're, you're fine with that. I'll tell you what, I'll mail it to you after I die. and They'll bury me in Chicago, but, uh, <laughs> you know, in, in all seriousness. And you'll vote in every election. Absolutely. Thereafter. I'll vote for Democrats. <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of change in the country. Uh, the cities are becoming more blue, so to speak. The countryside seems to be becoming more red. On the current trajectory we're at, if we don't take a greater role, where do you see the Second Amendment standing in, say, 10 years? I see the Second Amendment in 10 years maybe being better protected by courts than it has been. But on the other hand, I see a lot of lingering liberal uh, court judges and maybe justices disregarding anything that we win in court, uh, and they'll ignore 
those victories in the state legislatures too. Uh, if we don't right the ship this year and, and keep maintain the course that we're on, I see real trouble ahead for the Second Amendment. And uh, as I said earlier, it's going to require all of us to set aside any differences that we have, differences of opinion, differences of personality. We're all on the same side here, and we really do know who the enemy is. The enemy are the people who want to take the firearms away from us and turn the Second Amendment away from being a right to a government-regulated privilege. And when the government starts regulating privileges, they regulate those privileges right out of existence. You don't get to exercise that anymore. And that's what government does. Exactly. After all this, what is the single four-letter word that we all have to remember? Vote. (laughs) It's that simple. It is that simple. Well, Dave, we've covered a lot of great ground here, and I know there's a lot more. This is a subject we could both uh, talk passionately about for for hours and hours, but we will uh, call this a close for the time being. Uh, Appreciate what you do for us, what you do for the Second Amendment, and for talking with us here on the Guns Magazine podcast. Thank you. It It was a delight. I hope you've enjoyed this informative talk with Dave Workman, and I hope everyone takes his advice to personally make a commitment to vote this fall. With that, we hope you're enjoying the Guns Magazine podcast. Please tell all your friends, even the liberals. Guns Magazine is number one in the business, and we're using our decades of friendships to bring the most interesting chats in the gun world. If you have questions, comments, or a guest you'd like to recommend for the show, please email me, editor at gunsmagazine.com. Make sure you don't miss out on anything by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast directory and YouTube. Of course, you can always listen and download our episodes at gunsmagazine.com. And while you're at it, don't forget to check out our sister publication, American Handgunner Magazine at americanhandgunner.com. That's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast brought to you by Right On Optics. For the entire crew at FMG Publications, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now stay safe, and when you can, get out there and get shooting.